Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Anais Tipker. Uh, she, is a, she is the Just Energy Transition Lead Volunteer Organizer with 350 PDX. So, Welcome to the show. Thank you very much right, for yeah, having me. Good, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Um, so what is the Portland Just Energy Transition Initiative? So, uh, it's quite a mouthful, first uh, yes of all. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so the Portland Just Energy Transition Initiative, um, first let me say a little bit about where it comes from. Mm -hmm, it's, sure. it's a response to, I think, where we, where we are right now. Um, politically and environmentally um, in our city and in our country and in our world. So that's the big, big framing. But, yeah. um, but really, it's been, it's, it's a, it's an idea that's been in the, d in development for a couple years now. And it came out of a coalition of community groups um, that, that haven't always worked together in the past here in Portland. Uh, communities of color, organizations representing communities of color, as well as groups that have been um, more traditionally climate groups or environmental groups. And the conversation that started was really about how do we address, how do, how do we make the transition to a clean energy economy in a way that is just and inclusive and puts people who've been left out of economic development and out of addressing the climate crisis um, too often, right? Mm -hmm. So people not only who've been left out of those conversations here in our city, um, but who often are the people who are, who are first harmed um, by the fact that we are, we are already dealing with climate change. Mm -hmm. We're already dealing with um, the vulnerabilities that people face because um, it's getting hotter, um, there, there are a lot of ways, and, and then also there's a, you know, I, I say that people have been left out of this work, but I, I also want to be clear, like there are long ongoing environmental justice issues um, around air pollution, for example, mm -hmm. in this town where communities of color have been quite involved, you know, they have been mm -hmm. active, mm -hmm. but they haven't been heard. Uh, right, yes, so no, it's not right. that, that there hasn't been that activism in the community, but there hasn't been a way for this, the, the city has not always been that responsive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that's, as we were thinking about climate change um, and what we can do to address it at the city level, because, um, you know, frankly, this is the context we're feeling, not much is going to happen at the federal level uh, right now. We are, yeah. we are fighting a... a, a nothing a, positive is going to happen. Nothing positive <laughs> is going to happen, right. We're going to be fighting probably for a while just to to hold the line mm -hmm. in some sense. Um, but what can we do here at the city to, to, to build, um, to, to have a positive response, to do what we need to do, and to actually lead and show what, what a just transition looks like. And I, I think that's the term that a lot of people have used. I know you've, you've had other guests on the show mm -hmm. talking about uh, it. Yes, recently. Um, yes. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's a term people are talking about a lot mm -hmm. now. Um, and, and that's what this came out of. It's like, what, what can we actually do as a city, at the city level, um, to make a just transition real? Yeah. So, it took a... You so, yeah, yeah j just talk for a minute about what a just right, transition that's what I'm is. Oh, what a just transition right, is before uh -huh. I get to, to yeah, yeah, what yeah, this yeah, one will do. Yes, uh -huh, yeah. So um, there, I think, as I said, a lot of people are talking about it, so there are probably yeah, yeah. different ways to mm -hmm. define it. But I think um, one thing that is central is transition in terms of dealing with climate disruption is going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So transition is happening. Our choice right now is about what does that transition look like? And do we continue with social and economic models that are built on exploiting people and resources mm -hmm. um, that exacerbate unfairness or inequality? Or do we build something that incorporates 
justice, inclusion, um, tries to build an economy in a society that works for everyone, mm -hmm. truly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I think is um, a key piece of talking about a, a just transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right. yeah. so that's, that's one way of defining it. I think mm -hmm. there's also an important piece related to what I was talking about before about recognizing that, um, that often the people who are, I've heard this phrase used, people who are hurt first and worst mm -hmm. have not been included in making the changes we need to make. Mm -hmm. And so there is also that kind of um, redistributive justice that people who've been hurt in the past need to be ones who benefit. Need to, we need to make sure that they're benefiting from right. these yeah. changes. So y your group has made an effort to be sure to include those yes. people, well, those individuals and those organizations in the writing of this initiative. Absolutely, I mean, I, so uh, not just include them, but it, it, it really is actually led and initiated yes. mm -hmm. by groups uh, here in town such as the NAACP, was one of the uh, first groups, APANO, which is the Asia Pacific American Network of Oregon, um, NEA, the Native American Youth Alliance, uh, VERDE, which works with the Latino community, Coalition of Communities of Color was also very involved in the discussions. Um, they really are, were the driving force behind this, and I think then um, the, the climate groups, like the group that I'm associated with, uh, 350 PDX, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've just been delighted to be part of this discussion and to see that there's, you know, there's really recognition um, in those communities of how climate and social justice go together. I should mention Sierra Club too, they're, oh, yeah. they're mm -hmm. part of yeah. this as well. Yeah, a a and those communities of color, so I, I would say w white people generally don't think about them, Yeah. but they are the ones who actually are experiencing more of the ill effects of this climate crisis that we're in than anybody else. Absolutely. And uh, have, because of their um, position, uh, are least able to uh, respond. Right, yeah. And, and survive with it. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's, that's happening on the global scale, yes. right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you think of who in the world is affected, um, the, the majority of the world, which is not white people, yeah. mm -hmm. um, are feeling the, the worst effects, right? But even here in town, I mean, I think, um, I think one way it has played out here is that um, we, Portland has done good things for the environment mm -hmm. in the past, but without being intentional about how it might affect inequality. And it's both racial inequality and economic inequality, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we make improvements, we, when we make our city greener, right, that has the benefit, for example, of increasing property values. Mm -hmm. But if we're not intentional about, you know, who who that's affecting and who benefits, and we see already that we have a history of um, practices that have, you know, worked against communities of color being able to stay in their neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? Then um, there's there's this unintended effect of doing good things for the environment and doing bad things for the people who actually yes. live in this city, mm -hmm. and so that is the kind of thing. That, and so that also, you know, like thinking about housing and access to housing as a, as a climate issue in some sense is really kind of a new way mm -hmm. of thinking about this, especially for a lot of, of climate activists or environmental activists, especially, again, those coming who are white, the, mm -hmm. the ones who are white or who come from um, a middle class perspective, I think, are not as used to thinking about that. But as you say, communities of color, lower income people, are already very aware yeah. of what is, mm -hmm. is happening. Right, yeah. So, so let's, back to. Uh, yeah, let's get, <laughs> let's get back to the initiative and uh, talk about it, uh, specific so what, major provisions and so forth. Right, so what the, what the Portland Just Energy Transition Initiative proposes to do is to introduce an increase in a city licensing fee, which currently exists. Um, this is only in the city of Portland, and it's a licensing fee that businesses pay. What we're proposing, um, and this will, this will be a ballot measure, I'll talk more about that, but we're, we're planning for this to be a, a, on the ballot. Um, the, the increase would be from 2% of revenue, which is 
currently um, mm -hmm. what they pay to 3%. So it's a 1% increase in the tax. And in, it, the, in the fee. In the, in, in the fee, yes. Oh. We <laughs> <laughs> it is a fee, uh, but everyone ends up calling it a tax. Yes. And so you know, we're kind of saying, well, we're not, we're not going to pretend that this is not um, an increased uh, expense for mm -hmm. business. Um, the only companies that would pay this additional fee would be those that have over a billion dollars in retail revenue nationally. So this is targeting retailers that are very large and essentially that are, that are national or multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of Portland businesses would not actually pay this fee. But out of uh, those that did pay it, we would probably generate somewhere upwards of $30 million a year is what we have found from um, looking at the sort of state um, records. Mm -hmm. um, that money then would go to would would go into a fund that would be administered by uh, a citizens board, modeled on uh, the board that we have right now for the children's levy for distributing those funds, mm -hmm. and nonprofit organizations alone or in partnership with businesses and others would apply for those funds, and the funds would then be used for a couple of different things. But um, in the, the big buckets of what the money goes to would be for weatherization and energy efficiency with some transition um, to clean energy such as solarization, but, but mostly weatherization and, and um, retrofitting for energy efficiency of housing, mm -hmm. which is a tremendous burden actually on our, it's a, it's a huge part of our city's energy consumption, right? Within that big bucket, there would be um, money set aside specifically targeting doing that work for low-income people and in communities of color. So there would be targets, which are still being worked out exactly the size, but larger than anything that's been proposed in the past, targeting um, communities, as we said, who are often left out, right? That that work could be done to benefit them. So. One way this is different from other things, just quickly, is that it's um, it's designed in a way that money could be used, for example, for multifamily low-income housing, mm -hmm. which has not been the case with previous sort of energy efficiency programs. There would also be a so, so so actually building affordable housing. Um, well, or, I don't or, so I, I don't believe that it includes the capacity to build although the language is still not finalized. Uh -huh. uh, but no, but it, it the, so the problem has often been, as I understand it, um, that the, the, in the past when, when there was money available to do energy efficiency work, um, it wasn't really designed for use with um, multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. And if you could use it, there were, often you had to do other structural work, often low-income housing, um, whether it's for individuals or multifamily, um, there's other repair work that needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. And you couldn't use, for example, federal stimulus money to do that other work. You could only do it for very targeted things. This is designed more broadly so that you can do the repairs that need to be done in mm -hmm. order to um, make it more energy efficient, in order to do community solar on a, on a large um, housing, uh, not unit, but you know, development. to development. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, so there's there's more recognition that um, y you may have to improve the housing stock, which mm -hmm. is also a big issue here in Portland. The second big component of this uh, of what the money would be spent on is job training, and uh, for the workforce in these industries. So right now we don't have the workforce that we need uh, in order to do the level of energy efficiency uh, upgrades and, uh, and, and again, in solar, in the solar industry or in other sort of clean energy um, transition projects. We don't have the workforce. Priority would go to, and again, there would be specific targets for making those job uh, training and placement opportunities available 
to low-income folks and to communities of color. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a very important piece of this, that it is, it is also about training people and, and having the funds available to then ensure that when they get through their training, there's work there for them to do, mm -hmm. right? So I think um, there, there's also a piece just um, specifically uh, around local food production. So encouraging uh, local food production because that will also um, is about uh, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, getting us to produce more of our food locally is a way to reduce carbon. Um, and again, there's a, a diversity or a, there's a component to that of making sure that attention is paid to who, who gets the support for local food production. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, yeah, and so that's, that's, yeah. that's what it would do. Okay. It would raise money from the uh, large corporations to go into a targeted fund that would then pay, would ensure that we have the money to fund energy efficiency, weatherization, solarization, and the job creation and training in those fields mm -hmm. um, that we need to do. Okay, and, and it would target? And it would target the inclusion of people who too often have been left out of either the benefits of programs to do energy efficiency, weatherization, et cetera, mm -hmm. or have been left out of training programs. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is this is this is really exciting to me because you figured out a formula for doing this that uh, excites the environmental community and excites the uh, environmental justice mm -hmm. uh, people, the people that have been concerned about. Uh, equity and equality within within the community, uh, two 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 groups that normally don't talk to each other. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that I agree. That is what's exciting. That's what what um, what makes me be excited mm -hmm. about it. I mean, I I'm a volunteer. I do this um, because I do think this is tremendously important work, and this perspective is the one that I feel we we need to take, um, both because it makes sense in a way. Going back to talking about um, you know, what is a just transition, I think, I feel anyway that the, the challenge, that the, the exploitation of people and the exploitation of the planet are, are rooted in the same impulses yes. and the same kind of underlying logic of our current economy mm -hmm. and we need to address them both at the same time if mm -hmm. we don't we're not actually going to change things so right. I that's what I believe I also think strategically um, you know we're, we're at a moment where I think there's a lot of convergence mm -hmm. more than maybe there has been for a while anyway and so people are feeling that if we if we address just one thing, there's so many problems where we're, we're yeah. not we're mm -hmm. not going to get anywhere, and mm -hmm. we're going to be too divided. But when we start coming up with solutions that can address econom economic inequality, that recognize that um, that you know race has played a role in who gets benefits and who gets left out, right? When we start really building those things into how we think about addressing climate disruption, then we're so much more powerful. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's go to some of the some of the details about okay. how this gets done. Okay. Um, this is a, a pr pr proposed as an initiative. You're not going to go to the city council and ask them this to adopt it. Not right now. No. Um, I, I think that 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 was something we considered. Um, the the short answer to that is you know why we didn't go that route is I think um, the the funding mechanism that we're proposing. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether that should be. A, a broader tax base, meaning that you know we set a lower threshold um, and maybe have a cap on it, and um, it applies to more businesses. Um, uh, but we just didn't. The current city council that we have didn't really want to go forward with it in its current um, in, in the way that we're thinking about it mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Obviously, they're supportive of renewable energy mm -hmm. and a clean energy. Mm -hmm. um, the city has adopted. A plan to be 100% renewable, using 100% renewable energy by 2050, right. and the things that we're proposing to do, the weatherization, the energy efficiency—that's a huge piece, 
of how you actually have to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't money that came along with that, and so with that plan. And yeah. so we're saying the yes. money needs to come from somewhere, uh -huh. and we believe that it should come from large corporations, um, and that that they can pay they can pay their fair share mm -hmm. to do business sure. here in Portland. Yeah. Are there any restrictions on the types of companies that might pay this? Or there are. There are some, so it's retail sales. Mm -hmm. um, it's only, again, it's only within the city of Portland and it's only calculated on sales within Portland. Um, we, medicine is left out, um, groceries are not included. So um, some of the things that, you know, there are some exemptions, but um, it, very few. But we did right. try and think about, you know, what are essential services. That right, yeah, but the, uh, the, 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 the main qualification for having this surcharge, I'll call it a surcharge. Oh, that's a good, I <laughs> haven't heard anyone call it a surcharge, but <laughs> right, that yeah. might be a good way to, yeah, to think about right, it. Yeah. So the, the surcharge would be applied to corporations doing business in Portland who have national sales of over a billion dollars. Correct, right. yeah. Any, uh, any uh, estimate of how many comp corporations this would uh, cover? Uh, it's, uh, we have looked at that. It's around 125 uh -huh. around that. So there's about 125 companies that would have to pay that. Mm -hmm. And as far as we can tell, about 40% of them at least have various tax havens that they are using uh -huh. to try and reduce their their tax burden. So, so there's a, so there's so a tax fairness element. There is a here there's too. a strong tax fairness mm -hmm. element here. I think that that you know coming back to your saying why why not just do it as a uh, try and get city council. I think you know the the groups involved with this do also want this to be um, income redistribution in a sense from those large companies that by and large are not rooted in our communities. Mm -hmm. There are very few, um, fewer than half a dozen, yeah. Oregon-based companies okay. that, as far as we can tell, would have to pay right. this So, this less, less than a minute yeah. time frame. Oh, time frame for when we're doing this. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Very soon, we hope in the next month, um, that we will submit the language for this to the city, mm -hmm. and then the city comes back to us with any legal issues. Um, but our hope is that um, before the year is out, this meaning 2017, um, that we will have registered this and we will be starting to collect signatures okay. to get it on the ballot in 2018. In so 2018. starting starting January 2018, and um, that would then have this on the ballot in November of 2018. Okay, excellent, good. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having All right. me. All right, good, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so we've been talking with Anna East uh, Tipker, uh, who is the uh, lead volunteer organizer with 350 PDX on the Just Energy Transition Initiative. So uh, we'll uh, have her back on again later when we actually get this in the initiative signature gathering phase. So we, we are going to conclude our program today with a short video with two young children, Jeremy and Ava, talking about why we need a cap and invest program in the state of Oregon. Such a program addresses at the state level the global cri climate crisis while training workers for the good jobs in a renewable energy economy. We at the Alliance for Democracy see this as a companion measure with the Portland Just Energy Transition Initiative that we've just been talking about. My friends and I are worried about inheriting a world that's worse than the world our parents got. It's not fair. Fossil fuels like coal and oil pollute the air. Pollution heats up our world and makes it hard to breathe in our neighborhoods. So what do we do about it? We stop the bad stuff and do more of the good stuff. We need a law to price pollution and fund solutions. In the end, we'll have a bunch more people with good paying jobs and a totally clean economy. Renewable electricity, clean cars and trucks, and buildings that save energy. Here's how the idea works. First, put a limit on climate pollution for the largest sources. It fits over everything like a cap. 
The cap drops over time to reduce emissions. To make sure they follow the cap, there's a price on every ton of pollution they create. So, who's going to be covered? Not my mom's florist, or my dad's brew pub, or my favorite ice cream shop. We're talking big factories, fossil fuel power plants, oil companies that emit 25,000 tons of pollution a year. That's the same as burning 133 train cars full of coal in a year. An organ price on pollution could raise $700 million every year. What will we do with all that money? Well, it can only be spent to help our communities by reducing pollution and creating jobs. It could help pay for solar panels on our roofs. Clean power, which saves our parents money on electric bills. It could pay for safer roads and sidewalks. My school bus driver could see new traffic signals or new lanes on the road. More energy efficient, affordable homes could be closer to public transit. That money could help our farmers pay for high tech equipment that uses less power and water, which saves money. Investment would help create good paying jobs all over the state. My neighbors might be trained to install solar panels or work construction on an energy efficient building. They could build new wind farms in Oregon's wide open spaces. Kids in my class might become engineers, designers, road crews, salespeople, office assistants. All of the workers you need to run a successful business. These investments would help us all. And it encourages emitters to pollute less. My parents make me take out the trash. They pay to have it taken away. It's only fair that large polluters take some responsibility and pay for trash too. Our state has a chance to be a national leader by passing laws to help neighborhoods and our climate. Oregon has a history of success, growing the economy and protecting clean air. If I can talk to the lawmakers about clean energy jobs, then you can too. So call your state, state uh, senator and representatives now to support the clean energy jobs legislation to cap carbon and provide funds to develop a clean energy economy we all so desperately need. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>